Now we want to go a little bit deeper into our understanding of the differences between real and complex signals by understanding complex signals a little bit more. So the learning objectives for this section are to continue to understand and explain the difference between real and complex valued signals, and also to represent these complex signals as in terms of magnitude and phase signals, or in terms of real and imaginary parts. So this here is called the Cartesian, the Cartesian uh, representation of the signal. So we're going to be dealing with real and complex signals. Uh, real signals you're pr probably pretty familiar with, uh, especially from like calculus. Uh, you maybe you looked at f of x in calculus, but now you're looking at x of t in time. So for continuous time signals, you're familiar with a lot of operations you can do on those signals. Complex signals probably you have a little less experience with, but a complex signal is a signal whose output, the, the value that the signal takes on, is a complex number. And so at each time t, we can ask, what is the real part of x of t, and what is the imaginary part of x of t? And so these we get these two functions. So this is a, this is a function, and this is also a function, uh, representing the real part of the signal x of t and the imaginary part of the signal x of t. And we have this j here to combine the two. Complex signals can also be represented in terms of magnitude and phase. So this magnitude here, magnitude of x of t, it's not absolute value because it's a complex number. This is the square root of x of t times its conjugate, x star of t. Uh, so that's just the this value of the signal at t and the conjugate of the value at signal t, uh, signal at time t, and then we multiply the two and take the square root. Um, we can also write it in terms of the real part of x of t squared plus the imaginary part. It's just x of t squared. So, you know, what we're saying is if we think of this uh, complex number as a vector in the complex plane, we're asking for, you know, we're asking for its length. And that's what that magnitude of x of t is. And the phase is uh, this tangent inverse of the imaginary part of x of t over the real part of x of t. Right, so sometimes you'll see the phase represented as theta or lowercase or capital theta, or sometimes there's other notation for it in different different books and sources. We're going to try to use this uh, angle symbol to represent it because it it really represents the angle of the of the vector uh, is complex number viewed as a vector. So a handy dandy tool is Euler's relation. So we use this to break apart our merge complex exponentials um, to get sinusoids or other, you know, we combine sinusoids to get a complex exponential like e to the j omega t is cosine omega t plus j sine omega t. That's Euler's formula, uh, one form of it. And we can also break apart cosines into complex exponentials by taking e to the j omega t plus e to the minus j omega t and then dividing by two. And for the sine function, we have the same two terms, only there's a, there's a minus sign here. And it, we divide by 2j. And uh, if you've seen a different form of this, it's likely that you saw a form where the j was uh, in the numerator somehow. And that comes, you get that form by noticing that 1 over j is equal to minus j. And uh, just to prove that, you cross multiply by j. and uh, j squared is minus 1, so you get 1. So this process of breaking apart complex exponentials or merging them to, merging sinusoids together to get complex exponentials, we're going to call this Eulerizing, so that we don't have to say every time, now we apply Euler's relation to the formula. We're just going to say, let's Eulerize. We're going to see complex exponentials that uh, look like this. So this is what we call a complex exponential. It has a it has a constant term, but it's a complex valued constant term a, and then a complex exponential e to the j omega t, and that's a function of t. So this constant is not a function of t, right? In this in this sort of uh, formulation. So if you use the magnitude phase form, we can decompose this complex number a into its magnitude and phase. 
and then we can just uh, we can just multiply those those in here and substitute, and we get e to the j omega t plus phi. Right. So when we ask for the real and imaginary parts, we get a cosine term and a sine term corresponding to this this complex exponential term. And uh, so we get we get this uh, sort of real and imaginary decomposition. So what about the magnitude and phase representation? So going back to our rewriting of x of t, it's already in magnitude and phase representation. But just to be clear about it, we take the magnitude of of both of the parts. The product of two signals is the pro uh, magnitude of the product is the product of the magnitudes. And remember, e to the j something always has norm or magnitude equal to one. So we're just left with magnitude of a as the as the magnitude of x of t. And the phase is just what's upstairs multiplying j in the e to the j term. So that's just omega t plus phi. You can get this also from this tan inverse uh, formula that I saw before. The imaginary part is a sine. The real part is a cosine. So imaginary over real is a tangent function. Uh, and these constants we're going to cancel. And so we just get tan inverse of tan omega t plus phi. So it, you get omega t plus phi. And so we call this linear phase because the phase is a linear function of t, and linear phase signals are you know, kind of important uh, in linear phase systems when we get to that are also important for kind of protecting against uh, distortion. So an example of uh, now a sum of two complex exponentials, maybe we'll, we'll get rid of the constant term out front because it just makes things more complicated. So we have e to the j3t and e to the j2t. Each of these are, are unit vectors in the complex plane that are moving as a function of t that are ro rotating around uh, the unit circle. So we have, here's the complex plane, and we have one vector here, and we have one vector here, and we're trying to look for you know, their sum, which is over here. And so, this sum is moving about in some weird trajectory. We want to know what does that trajectory look like? You know, is it is it nicely behaved or what is it what does it look like? So we can ask, well, what are the real and imaginary parts of this trajectory? And that's pretty easy because you just when you have the sum of two signals, you just add up the real parts and add up the imaginary parts. For magnitude, we can use a little trick here, and this is not a trick that you might have thought of, but uh, it comes up in some occasions, so it's helpful to kind of see it once before you see it again. So we're going to look at 2 and 3, which are uh, the values multiplying t in these two complex exponentials. Now, what we know is that we can get a sinusoid if we have something that's like minus b and b, and here's 0. So the trick is to use uh, factoring out a term to shift this 2, 3 down to minus b and b. So we need to look at the midpoint here. This is 2.5, which is another way of saying that is uh, 5 halves. So we'll factor out e to the j 5 halves t, and then we can see that 3 minus 5 halves is 1 half, and 2 minus 5 halves is minus 1 half, so here b is equal to a half. And that means that uh, using Eulerizing here, so we Eulerize, uh, we get this complex exponential times 2 cosine t over 2. So to get the magnitude, it's the product of two signals. We take the magnitude of the products. This term is equal to 1. And then we have 2 cosine t over 2, absolute value of that. And so we get 2 times this rectified cosine. So it helps to kind of sketch this out so you have a picture. Always draw a picture because Gives some intuition, so we have this uh, this cosine which has been which has been rectified, fully rectified. So, for the phase though, there's no free lunch. So we have to stick with the general formula. Take the inverse tangent of the imaginary part over the real part, which we just did on the previous page. So uh, for yourself, here are a couple other of ex examples that you can try. I think that. Doing examples is always a great way to build some intuition, especially if you feel like you're not 
quite up to speed on complex numbers and complex functions.